Hey there folks and welcome back to the channel. Now in this one we're going to be taking a look at a very exciting Thursdoid from the Project Zomboid developers. For those that want to read the development update in full, there will as always be a link in the description. Otherwise I'll be doing my best to summarise the update for all its biggest talking points and giving a couple of thoughts of my own here and there. If you find the video useful or informative, consider dropping it a like and subscribing for more news, tips and guides. Now with the introduction out of the way, let's Let's jump into the biggest part of this Thursdoid. Animals, hunting, and animal migration. I know a lot of players, just like myself, have been really excited to hear more about the upcoming animals in Build 42, and well, we've been given plenty in this update to take a look at. The developers start by emphasizing how important animals will be in Build 42, not just for immersion and atmosphere, but also as a key to both survival and advanced crafting techniques that are expected to come with Build 42. 42 as well. We're given a snippet of footage containing a hunter coming across some deer in the wild, but more importantly than that, we next get a look at some migration paths and even some tracking of the same deer. In this video, we see a virtual herd of deer following a path that has been set by the map designers and can also be used by modders on their own maps too. As the deer follow said path, they leave a breadcrumb trail for hunters to pick up the scent. The devs note that right now, this virtual herd contains a buck, some doe, and several fawns, but that this structure will be more varied by the time this feature reaches us. The devs go on to explain further that each type of breadcrumb the deer leaves behind will indicate different elements of their life and present different hints to the player. For example, tracks will present a rough direction of the herd to the player, whereas items like flattened grass or herbs will suggest a sleeping spot. There's some other examples we see in this video footage, but it's really good to know that this is going to be quite a varied part of the game. Now, what's particularly interesting about the animals in my mind is what goes on when they aren't rendered in by a player being close enough to them. When there's no player present nearby, they're essentially virtual and carry out predefined actions at predefined spots on a timetable, according to the developers. For example, they will head to certain spots to sleep for a while between the hours of 12pm and 4pm for about half half an hour. Between the hours of 4pm and 6pm, as well as 5am and 7am, they will stop to eat for a while too. The developers make a note here that all of this is easily changed in the back end, and will also be adjusted for whatever wild animals make their way into the game in future. So I guess what this means for players is that if you can find a spot that has deer activity for resting or grazing, it's highly likely that you'll find deer there in the future if you're patient enough and know roughly what kinds of times the deer check in. I'm no hunter of course, but I'd imagine this is somewhat similar to how it goes in reality, identifying a frequently travelled feeding spot and lying in wait for the right moment. The developers then go on to mention that they'd love to implement a skill for tracking, but that discussion is ongoing as to how that will be represented in game at the moment, so they aren't quite ready to show this element of the hunting process just yet. Hopefully we get to see a little of that in future dev blogs. They'd also like to look at window direction and the possibility of human smell scaring off wild animals, but that they'd intend to look at that layer a bit further down the line. The footage that has been playing in the background for a little bit now, and I'll continue to leave up going forward, was just a bit of surrounding footage of a survivor setting up camp and some of the ambient sounds we can expect when doing so, to give a real idea of what this kind of survival will be like. Have a listen to some of these ambient sounds for a minute before I move on. Now, you might be thinking already that this is some pretty major stuff being shown in this blog post, and you'd be absolutely correct, but the developers haven't stopped there in this one and move on to crafting next. And believe me when I say you're gonna love this part. We get a detailed look at some brand new crafting, specifically pottery. This was quite a lengthy bit of footage that they provided, so I'll leave this playing whilst I cover what the developers have focused on in this segment. Firstly, they start with a reminder that this level of crafting will be completely 
optional. At the end of the day, we'll be able to simply acquire the non-crafted version of a lot of the stuff we can make through pottery via looting buildings or households, but the developers remind us that this is being built to address the weaker end game of Project Zomboid, and to provide alternatives for games that have passed months and years down the line. They want to provide a depth of gameplay outside of interacting with zombies, and they specifically say they're going all out to make crafting possibilities as exhaustive as possible. Likewise, they are also building some new and more powerful crafting systems for modders to get their teeth into as well. The developer's aim is to provide an environment where a village of players can survive even if in total wilderness with no signs of civilization. Now, specifically in reference to pottery, an example of this is working with clay. In this system, clay can be dug up from near rivers and will be used to make bricks, tiles, roofing, pottery, and a host of other items, according to the developers, that can be placed in the world or used. So no more wood or metal housing, if we want to push further than that, we'll be able to use bricks to actually build a sturdier structure out in the wild. We see all kinds of crafting uses for clay in this video clip that we're provided, using a host of crafting benches like a pottery wheel and a kiln. Without these benches, creating items by hand is sometimes possible, but takes much more time to complete. We can see that kilns require fuel to produce usable pottery items, and from there, they can even be glazed, although the use for this isn't mentioned in the video or the blog. I assume this is probably just for aesthetic purposes. For construction purposes, like making tiles or bricks, the player requires a clay mold for that particular item so that it can be sculpted before being put into the kiln. We can also see in the player's inventory, there's a couple of tools like a brush and a clay sculpting tool, which is required in many of the crafts. The video then focuses on larger crafting stations that can be built as you get more experience and materials which have the capability to refine multiple items at once. And we see some new decorative tiles as well, which is a nice touch. So some huge crafting developments are being made and I'm now really looking forward to getting my hands on these when Build 42 comes around. If this is just one element of the crafting, I can't wait to see what else the devs have been cooking up behind the scenes. Going back to those decorative tiles for a moment, the team have also welcomed a popular Project Zomboid modder to the team known as Daddy Dirky Dirk, who specializes in tiles and will be creating these for the team going forward as the crafting system is being developed. A gentleman named Igor has also joined the multiplayer team, focusing on optimization and upgrades for the existing multiplayer experience, which brings me nicely into the very last part of this blog post I have to cover, which is a quick paragraph or two on the engine upgrade that's going on for Project Zomboid right now. The team essentially summarizes that this process is going very well at the moment, reaching FPS of several hundreds on the developer hardware when zoomed out. However, with that said, they are still looking into optimizations for how the current fog and puddles work in-game, which are both graphically intensive operations that need updating frame by frame. At the moment, this invalidates the cached chunks and diminishes some of the gains from the optimizations made in that area, so they're looking into that further right now. The team plan to revisit these systems to optimize them for the new rendering system, either before the first public release or very possibly in the follow-up build. So that's just about it from me about this dev blog. A couple of major implementations being worked on right now, that's for sure. I'd be really interested to hear from you guys in the comments as always. Let me know what you're looking forward to most from this dev blog, whether there's anything you'd really like to see as an expansion to some of these features, and of course, have I missed anything in the footage that we were given? Let me know. Special thank you, as always, to my wonderful patrons for their support. If you're interested in playing on our Project Zomboid server, we're running an Atomic Summer themed wipe at the moment, and there's a link in the description to get involved if you'd like to join my existing patrons. Thanks, folks, and I will see you all in the next one.